away, these are the top 10 films of 1946. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. Cheers. In at number 10, Beauty and the Beast. One of the best adaptations of the classic fairy tale. The thing this French film by poet Jean Cocteau does better than any other version is the Beast's castle full of living inanimate objects. It's eerie, scary, and strangely beautiful. One thing that doesn't work quite so well, though, is the reveal of the beast, where he just appears from behind a bush. In a number nine, Bedlam. Should this B-movie horror about the infamous insane asylum keep classics like Gilder off the list? Probably not, but I just love how strange it is. Set around the asylum Bedlam, this is on one hand typical Boris Karloff fare, but on the other also a strangely camp romantic film inspired by the paintings of William Hogarth. All this adds up to create something that doesn't entirely work, but is absolutely riveting. In a number eight, A Matter of Life and Death. The marvellous Powell and Pressburger tackle life, death and love in this incredibly inventive picture. It has similar plot elements to the 1941 film Here Comes Mr. Jordan, but rather than a boxer who was meant to die, but accidentally remains on Earth, here we have a World War II fighter pilot played by David Niven who misses his scheduled appointment with Heaven. Much like that film, an office worker from the Heavenly Gates is sent to get him, but there is a snag. He's just gone and bloody fallen in love, the rascal. The highlight of this movie is the representation of the afterlife. It's truly unique, and unlike most films with a real world and a fantastical world, here it's the fantastical one that is black and white, showing that while heaven exists, it's ultimately a lifeless place. The shots of all the fallen soldiers during the court case must have had a huge impact in 1946, with so many people having lost someone close to them. In a number seven, The Big Sleep. She looked playful and eager but not quite sure of herself, like a new kitten in a house where they don't care much about kittens. I love Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe novels, and I've read all of them, but every time I get lost and have no idea what's happening. And Howard Hawke's adaptation of the first full Marlowe novel is just as hard to follow. Famously during the production, the cast and crew had no idea who killed one of the characters. Raymond Chandler was sent a memo, and he didn't know either. Humphrey Bogart is perfect as Marlowe. He may be five feet too short, but he makes up for that in charisma, toughness, and by being totally nonchalant. The sexual charge between him and Lauren Bacall is once again present, but the sexiest scene in the film is when Marlowe shelters from the rain with a bookseller and they share a bottle of rye. Little things like that make it up. Hello. Hello. I once tried to do that and I was just asked to leave. In a number six, Shoeshine, one of the best Italian neo-realist films. Those Italians love to show the hardship of life through the eyes of children, doubling the tragedy, but also making it a little cute. This film follows the tough lives of two shoeshine boys who want to buy a horse. They get involved in crime to pay for the animal, but are soon caught. We follow their time in a youth detention centre. The two friends are put in separate cells, and both their fellow inmates and the officers in control turn them against each other. It's a wonderful film about friendship and childhood. The talk of respect and not ratting on each other shows how it's likely these young men will remain in a life of crime. There are some terrific sequences and the two central performances are astonishing. A great film. In a number five, Notorious. 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 Alfred Hitchcock directs a film starring Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman who are on the hunt for Nazis in South America. What's not to like? The war may have been over, but hiding remaining Nazis turned out to be a good plot for many a film after the worldwide conflict had ended, with Orson Welles' The Stranger having a similar setup. Here we have Cary Grant playing it rather more serious than usual, as a spy who gets Bergman to go undercover with Claude Rains' Nazi official hiding out in Rio. It's a wonderful spy thriller, but also has some wonderful romantic and human touches. Bergman and Grant's performances usually get all the attention, and that is certainly fair, but I don't think Claude Rains gets enough love here. He's got the impossible job of making a bloody Nazi sympathetic, and he manages to do it. He's a weak man in love, and also strangely trapped himself. 
a terrific performance in a film filled with terrific performances. One of Hitchcock's best. See Notorious for tense dramatic impact. See Notorious. Notorious. In a number four, The Killers, one of the great film noirs of the 1940s. Based on Ernest Hemingway's short story, this dark tale begins with our protagonist being murdered. The whole opening is absolutely riveting, with two hitmen giving terrifying performances as they threaten the patrons in a small town diner. The rest of the film follows an insurance investigator as he traces what happened, and it's filled with wonderful twists and turns. Burt Lancaster in his breakthrough role is fabulous as the doomed boxer. He is such a screen presence and makes this melancholic, dangerous man totally relatable. The film looks excellent and the non-linear narrative works a treat. Noirs don't tend to have a happy ending, but this starts bleakly and the whole film unfolds slowly until we find out why it happened and why Lancaster didn't even try to flee. Top noir storytelling. In a number three, Paisan. Probably my favourite Italian neo-realist film. The middle part of Rossellini's neo-realistic trilogy is a totally unique film. It's really six short films, starting down in Sicily and slowly working its way north through Italy, telling different stories about the end of the Second World War. A common theme amongst them is the communication difficulties between the US soldiers and the Italians they are helping fight the fascists. Language is a theme very rarely used in film, which is insane considering how much it affects the world. Each of the six stories are great, but my personal favourites pack a huge emotional punch. There's the one involving a black American soldier who gets drunk and has his shoes stolen by an Italian orphan, and the one about another drunk American soldier and his interactions with a prostitute in Rome. These stories are about people in a world affected by violence and tragedy, people brought together, who struggle to talk to each other, but who can still understand each other through their shared humanity. It's a powerful film that makes the best use of the astonishing Italian countryside and cities filled with rubble, and also mixing it all with news footage to create something totally authentic and original. An Italian masterpiece. In a number two, My Darling Clementine one of John Ford's very best westerns. There have been many films about Wyatt Earp and the gunfight at the OK Corral, but this is my personal favourite. It may not be the most historically accurate, but it has this unique tone and pace that makes it utterly hypnotic. So much of this film revolves around just hanging out in the town of Tombstone. It captures a sense of the day-to-day -day life in these rough boom towns. Not a lot to do other than sit, gamble and drink. The film is slow without ever being boring, as you are totally swept up in the world Ford has created. The marvellous Henry Fonda plays Wyatt. He and his brothers are driving cattle to California. The youngest brother is killed and their cattle are stolen. They end up in a rough town where Fonda becomes the marshal. We spend time in this town with them, as they get to know the locals, including the charismatic Doc Holliday, and it eventually builds to a shootout between the brothers and the cattle rustlers who murdered their brother. But the focus of this film is not about this conflict. It's about life there, about the relationships between the characters. John Ford was one of the greatest directors of all time. His command of the camera, his ability to tell riveting stories, and his ability to create an atmosphere of the Old West. In only 97 minutes, you feel like you live in this town with these men, and it's a world I love to return to. And in the number one, it's a wonderful life. I'm not a big fan of Christmas, and I'm somewhat of a misanthrope, but this uplifting fantasy drama is so good that it's impossible to not fall in love with it. People often see this as an overly positive movie, but I think they're only thinking about the ending. It is sugary sweet, but the film has earned that because most of this film is pretty bleak. It's about a man played by James Stewart. Uh, uh, who intends to kill himself, uh, and a guardian angel uh, looking to secure his wings steps in. It's about a man uh, who's given everything to his community, but has seemingly lost everything himself, uh, and lost all hope, uh, uh, based on the short story uh, of The Greatest Gift, which it itself is obviously inspired by A Christmas Carol. It's a Wonderful Life uh, is about how kindness and generosity to others is a, is a way to live. Frank Capra's direction is faultless and full of inventive touches. This is a film, however, that almost entirely relies on its central performance. If they had miscast the lead, the film would have sunk as quickly as the main character had intended to. James Stewart is 
perfect in the lead. He's likeable, sympathetic, charismatic, and you genuinely worry for him. Charm is a hard thing to pull off. Often when a film tries to be a tearjerker, you realise the filmmaker's intentions and you can see the strings they're trying to pull. Here, Capra is a masterful puppet master. You can't help but be moved by the film. It's a Wonderful Life is a wonderful film about the best of humanity. Right, so counting down my top ten. In a number ten, Beauty and the Beast. In a number nine, Bedlam. In a number eight, A Matter of Life and Death. In a number seven, The Big Sleep. In a number six, Shoeshine. In a number five, Notorious. In a number four, The Killers. In a number three, Paisan. In a number two, My Darling Clementine. And in a number one, It's a Wonderful Life. Well, those are my top 10 films of 1946. What are your top 10 films of 1946? I'm going to go to the, uh, my local bookstore.